Mr. Piglet, do you think any of my students know that I sleep in my office? Welcome to Module 7, Lecture 16. We've now moved away from international law and international organizations and into the penultimate module of our class, and that is on international political economy. So, what is IP? It's a subfield of international relations focused on the study of international economic activities. Most of the topics that are covered include international trade, monetary relations, and the role of multinational corporations as actors in international affairs. It largely centers on economic relations between industrialized states, but in increasing years we've seen an emphasis on the role of what are called South-South relations or relations among countries in the developing world. For the IPE folks, states remain the most important actors, but they're not as important as they are in the realm of, say, international security. So although we're going to talk about two major approaches to IPE here, we'll see in a later lecture that we've also talked about three different types of approaches, uh, but there are two in general that we're going to focus most of our efforts on. So the first is mercantilism. And for mercantilists, they stress the importance of economic tra transactions uh, as it pertains to the military. And we talked about this several lectures ago, but the idea is that you use your resources and you gain access to new territory that you can develop for monetary gain, but all with the explicit purpose of enriching and enlarging the size of your military. For mercantilists, relative power is more important than absolute power. So they don't care necessarily that they're richer than they were yesterday uh, as far as a country is concerned, but what's more important is that they're richer than the next country that they're competing with. And states must protect their own interests at the expense of others. So does this sound familiar like any of the other theories that we've covered in the past? It should. The goal is to create the most favorable distribution of wealth or balance of trade, and that is the number of exports or the amount of exports minus the number of imports. On the other hand, you have economic liberalism. And economic liberals believe that through cooperation, states can realize mutual gains. So for an economic liberal, absolute power in terms of increased wealth is more important than relative power. So it doesn't matter if you are better off than the next country, as long as you are better off overall, and other states can also have improved economic gains, uh, but that doesn't detract from your own country's economic improvements. It is widely considered to be the dominant approach in Western economics, which will explain a lot of what we're going to look at in the next few slides and even into the next lecture about the role of certain institutions and processes in the realm of international political economy and whether they are uh, overall a, an improvement upon existing structures and systems or whether they lead to negative consequences that are not often paid enough attention to by IR scholars. <clears throat> so the goal for economic liberals is to achieve optimal efficiency, and that can be uh, attained through promotion of free trade, which we'll discuss more throughout this lecture. So we're going to pause for a moment and watch a brief video that explains comparative advantage, because it is the theory that helps to explain especially the economic liberal standpoint. To explain why countries trade, we must look at a little economic theory. The first concept we'll consider is called the theory of absolute advantage. If a country has the absolute advantage in the production of a good or service, it means it's the most efficient producer of that product. In other words, if all countries use the same inputs in their production process, this country would be able to make more better quality products than all the others. Let's construct a simplified theoretical example to illustrate the point. Imagine for a moment that we live in a world where there are only two countries, South Africa and Japan. Now both countries have differing capabilities to produce two products, wheat and DVDs. Now over a certain time period, 
South Africa can either produce 55 bags of wheat or 11 DVDs using all their resources. Japan, on the other hand, can either produce 18 bags of wheat or 72 DVDs using all the available inputs that they have. So, knowing that each country must choose how to allocate its resources between the production of these two goods, does it make sense for South Africa to produce any DVDs? The answer is no. Japan is obviously much more efficient in the production of DVDs than South Africa, while South Africa is much more efficient in the production of wheat than Japan. But both countries need both products, so it makes sense for South Africa to provide Japan with South African-grown wheat in exchange for DVDs made in Japan. If each country concentrates on producing what it's naturally good at, if they specialise in that good, both countries can then trade with each other and end up with more of both products than if they try to produce it all themselves. The consumers in both countries also benefit because they will be buying products made by the most efficient producer. And according to the economic theory, it means that the price paid for these products should be the cheapest. Why? Well, because the producers making the two products are the most efficient at it and can make more of the product for less than their competitors. Remember that as a consumer, you will not buy the same product from a seller who's more expensive. So the economic principle of absolute advantage is that you should specialise in the production of something that you're good at making. You will be efficient in the production of that good or service and the price you sell at will be the most competitive. Now, why is this considered so important in economics? Well, remember, economics is all about satisfying unlimited wants and needs. How can we get all of the things we want with such limited resources? Resources we really can't afford to waste through inefficient production. Okay, let's try and take the theory a bit further. According to this new table, we assume that South Africa has an absolute advantage with both products. It can efficiently produce either wheat or DVDs. Looking at this new data, it would seem that there is no longer any reason for trade between these two countries. But this is not quite true. Let's see why. Remember that each country must decide how to allocate its resources. In a simplified example, we'll say that if South Africa concentrates all of its resources on DVD production, it can make eight DVDs. But this means losing out on the wheat. And if they focus all their efforts on wheat production, they can produce 40 bags while sacrificing any DVD production. The best way to help South Africa decide how to allocate resources is to calculate how much it costs to make one DVD. Comparatively, how much wheat does South Africa have to give up to make one DVD? It's not too tricky. Divide 40 by 8, which gives us 5. So, for each DVD we produce, we could have grown 5 bags of wheat. In other words, each DVD we make costs South Africa five bags of wheat. Now, over in Japan, if they choose to produce four DVDs, they can't produce any wheat because of their limited resources. And if they focus on just producing the eight bags of wheat, there's nothing left for DVD production. Doing the maths, eight divided by four, we can see that it will cost Japan two bags of wheat to make one DVD. So, Comparing the cost of production in both countries, South Africa has to give up five bags of wheat for each DVD it makes, while in Japan, it only costs two bags of wheat to make one DVD. So DVDs cost more in terms of bags of wheat given up in South Africa than they do in Japan. Or in less clumsy language, it's cheaper for Japan to make DVDs. So Japan should make the DVDs. And it also makes sense that South Africa should produce the wheat. And that's the theory of comparative advantage. OK, well, I hope you enjoyed that video. And what we're going to do now is look at another simplified example that illustrates comparative advantage. So on the left, you see the production possibilities frontier of Brazil. And on the right, the production possibilities frontier for China. And what's important to note is these are the abilities of both of these respective countries 
in terms of the resources that they have to produce two kinds of goods, rice and coffee. In the case of Brazil, they can produce 12 pounds of coffee for the same amount of resources it would take to produce four pounds of rice, which means that there's a three to one ratio in favor of the production of coffee. On China's terms, there's an eight to two ratio or simplified four to one in the production of rice using the same amount of resources it would take to produce coffee. So under the theory of comparative advantage, both of these countries specialize in what they're good at producing, what they have a comparative advantage in producing, given that they have a limited amount of resources. So you would have Brazil trading with China, Brazilian coffee for Chinese rice. But in the real world, we have lots of different kinds of political interference in what would otherwise be free markets. So there's no such thing as a completely free market, and let's talk about certain kinds of deviations from that. Uh, these political intrusions into economic transactions are market imperfections. So they include things like a monopoly or oligopoly, where one or a very small set of producers has complete control over an entire industry. In the United States, there's legislation to try and counteract that so that no one company is able to overtake an entire industry. Also, think about the implications of an, a monopoly or an oligopoly. If there's only one, one actor in town, say you, you wanted to go buy groceries, and right now we have lots of different grocery stores, right? We have Publix, we have Winn-Dixie, we have Fresh Market, we have Trader Joe's, we have Ralph's, there's all these different kinds, right? Well, if there was only one place that you could go, then that one market would be able to set the terms of how much things cost because you would have no other alternatives. So that would be a reason why you wouldn't want to have a monopoly or an oligopoly. Say there were just a couple of two or three different uh, grocery stores that you could go to. So with competition, with variety, you have the opportunity to have greater choice and potentially go to the places that have lower prices because these places will have to compete with one another on different types of uh, points, whether it's price points or the customer service you get and all those things. So if there's one actor that has the lion's share of the uh, business in a particular industry, then that's a monopoly and it means that they don't have to compete. Corruption can also be a political intrusion, right? So if someone is actively stealing from the coffers of the businesses that are selling goods to people or asking for kickbacks and that kind of thing, then uh, the sellers may have to increase their prices to make up for the amount of money that they're not getting. Um, and the benefits from those transactions are not being distributed across all of the relevant actors because they're being captured by one or several people who have a, some kind of stake in that particular enterprise, but are, for all intents and purposes, uh, preventing the full scope of economic benefit from being realized because they're taking so much of it up themselves. Believe it or not, taxation is a form of political intrusion because you have the cost of a product and then a tax gets added onto that, which means that the price is higher than what you would have paid in the absence of a tax. So when you buy airline tickets, for example, and maybe you go online and you see, oh, there's a round trip ticket from Jacksonville to Los Angeles and it's $250. But then you go to make the purchase and it comes out to $275. And that's because of these taxes and fees that are levied on top of that. And so the actual price may be much larger than you thought. And this can have implications for the entire market itself because it doesn't reflect just the base value of the good. Sanctions are another form of political intrusion. When countries disagree with the way that other countries are engaging in their own behavior, they may send a signal about their displeasure through a sanction. So for a long time, the United States had sanctioned countries like Iran, Iraq, even Cuba. And so these sanctions are meant to tell the international community that this country is doing something that you or other countries disagree with. And that introduces a market imperfection because it means that your country is not going to be able to trade on perhaps some kinds of goods with this other country. So there's not going to be perfect uh, free market flow of goods and services across countries. Another one is self-reliance or what is known as autarky. And this is where a country decides that it doesn't need any other countries. And it's going to produce everything on its own 
and it will not require the use of anyone else's uh, products or services. But here's the rub. Most countries aren't good at doing everything. This is one of the ideas underlying the theory of comparative advantage, right? That you are more effective, more efficient at producing some goods than others. Whether it's because you're endowed with labor or technology or natural resources or whatever it might be, but countries are not efficient at producing absolutely everything. So by relying only on yourself, then you are introducing a market imperfection because other countries might be able to provide you that good more efficiently, and then you can use your resources to producing what you are best at. And so part and parcel to this discussion of market imperfections is a discussion about protectionism. And that means protection of domestic industries from international competition. Now this sounds like, in the realm of free market capitalism, something you wouldn't want to do, but we regularly do this all the time, and we see this all throughout the world. So why do we see protectionism at all? Well, there's several reasons. For one, you might want to shield infant industries. Lots of nations have been successful at using this kind of a strategy in the short term. So what they would do is, say you were the United States, and you want to focus on a brand new industry. Say it's virtual reality helmets, right? And right now, say Japan is able to produce virtual reality goggles in a way that is more efficient using better technology than you are. So you know that if you both compete initially when you release your products out into the international market, you're going to lose because Japan has already had experience and maybe through economies of scale, their products are even cheaper as well as better. So what you can do is you can prevent your infant industry of the virtual reality helmets uh, from engaging in the international market, from losing an in international competition, give it enough time to build up to speed its economies of scale, to reduce the cost over time, until such point that you are able and comfortable with putting your product out there in the international market, at which point maybe you'll be in a better position to reap the benefits from developing this new industry. So you might want to adopt a protectionist stance, at least in the short term, if you are trying to create a new industry, but know that it will not be successful without preventing it from uh, encountering competition for at least some time. Another is that you want to provide breathing room for domestic industries. So say you have domestic industries like the auto industry in the United States, and it's losing out to foreign competition left and right. Automobiles coming from Japan are better made, um, they are more fuel efficient, and they're more desirable by American consumers. Well, you can prevent the incursion of Japanese automobiles into the United States by adopting certain protectionist measures so that you can allow your domestic industries to regain the foothold in the market share that they had previously lost from, from international competition. So in this sense, it works kind of in both ways. Both, it could be used to protect infant or new industries, but it also could be used to protect existing industries that are struggling to compete with uh, foreign competitors. Another reason you might want to engage in protectionism is if you realize that certain industries may be vital to national security. So if you want to think about the likelihood of war occurring in the future, well, what are the inputs to our war efforts that we would need in order to spin up to speed and be able to compete uh, and use these products that the United States is known for producing that can be useful in the act of war? So these are, would include things like you know, the auto industry, steel, uh, maybe uh, coal, and things like that. So these are types of industries that you wouldn't want to completely rely on other countries to provide you, because in the event of a war, what if you're at war with one of those countries that you get, say, steel from? Well, then that country can completely choke off your steel supply, and now you're going to be scrambling to figure out how it is that you can possibly develop enough steel to make the tanks and airplanes that you need to engage in war. So where there's a, a recognized need that may be used for uh, the inputs for war machinery or for war efforts in general, you may be careful about trying to rely too much on your international competition to provide those to you, even if it's more uh, economically uh, advisable in the short term, because if you wind up getting into a war with one of those countries, you're going to be left holding your hat because you won't know what to do when you are missing out on these important inputs 
that are central to your preservation of national security. Another thing you can do, uh, or you can implement protectionism to ward off predatory practices, what is also known as dumping. And this is where another country decides to sell their products in your country, but far below the value that would be worthwhile for reaping benefits and profits from the other country, and it's just to kill the domestic industry in your own country. So say that China wanted to destroy the uh, electronics industry in the United States. So an example of engaging in dumping would be that Chinese uh, DVD players are being sold here in the United States for $10. Now, even though the price of DVD players has gone down precipitously over the past couple decades, you would still be stuck in a situation where the United States could not produce, because of our labor costs and environmental costs and things like that, DVD players for, say, less than $50. So if there's simply no way to compete with the price of a dumped product, then it's going to wash out your industry completely. And this is something that countries debate about, and often some countries get in trouble with under the World Trade Organization for allegations that they are dumping their products just to decimate the industry in another country. So what are the tools that are relevant to protectionism? Uh, tariffs are probably the most important and notable. These are basically just taxes on imported goods. And then there are also a slew of what are called non-tariff barriers that can also be used to uh, implement protectionism. And these include things like quotas, subsidies, restrictions and regulations, and even economic nationalism. So quotas are just hard numbers of the amount of products that you're allowed to import from other countries. So during the uh, 1970s and 1980s, the United States put quotas on Japanese automobiles because they thought that they posed a threat to the domestic auto industry. So they restricted the amount of Japanese cars that could be imported in a given year. That way, they would never fully overtake the American auto industry. Uh, subsidies are another kind of uh, non-tariff barrier. So this is where you provide, uh, say, farmers, right, additional money to grow crops that they're used to growing. And uh, because they otherwise would be economically uncompetitive compared to, say, what they could produce in developing countries because of labor costs, because of technology, and those sorts of things. So the federal government subsidizes farmers, so it provides them with a chunk of money so that they can artificially lower the price of their goods and to remain economically competitive. So even though subsidies help to support certain interest groups like farmers, for example, they introduce a market imperfection that doesn't reflect the true price of an actual good. Then there are restrictions and regulations. One of the more important ones uh, that I think is, is necessary to mention are environmental regulations. So when I worked as an intern for the Department of Commerce back when I was in college, one of the issues that I looked into was what are known as NAFTA trucks. And these are trucks that were coming over from Mexico into the United States bearing Mexican goods. And yet, what was really interesting was that Mexican trucks didn't meet environmental and safety standards for here in the United States. So there was an issue before the Supreme Court about whether or not it was legally permissible under the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, to allow NAFTA trucks into the United States, given that there were these environmental and safety concerns. Because think about it this way. If a truck comes over to the United States from Mexico and pollutes into the atmosphere and causes asthma, who's left paying the bill for the health costs? It's not the Mexican government. Or what if these trucks, because they are overfilled and heavier than we normally allow trucks to be in the United States, they destroy the quality of the highways? Well, who is responsible for paying for uh, correcting the highways and fixing them? It's the United States. So these are costs that are offset to the United States even though they're caused by Mexico. And the Supreme Court actually found in favor of the Mexican trucks and decided that it was against the North American Free Trade Agreement and uh, a contravention of international law to not provide uh, completely open access to these NAFTA trucks, assuming that they follow all the other regulations. And so the Supreme Court had to address these issues of environmental and safety regulations, which are different between these two countries. They're not the same. So that means that what may work in one country may not be useful or uh, appropriate for another. And so these are measures that can be used to prevent other countries from engaging in economic activities in a different country. And then finally, economic nationalism is this idea that 
uh, we should only be buying, say, American goods. And even though that's kind of a soft restriction, uh, it still has been very relevant throughout American history. 